<laughs> Hi, everyone. Good evening, good morning, good night, wherever you are. Um, here is Jim Clav and MBA Spotlight, and we are happy to present you our very last session, very last but not, uh, not least, Columbia Business School. Um, thank you very much, Kate, for your time. Thank you very much, Rashid, for your time. Um, I will hand over to you the presentation directly, and we will come back, and I will come back later on for a question and answer session. Um, everyone who is watching the session live, please feel free to submit all questions online in the thread, and we will be happy to answer them afterwards. Welcome. Thank you so much, Olga. Hi, everybody. My name is Kate Holden. I am part of the admissions committee at Columbia Business School. Thank you all so much for tuning in today from wherever you may be joining around the world. Um, we're very excited to be here to share some information about our full-time MBA program and the application process. Um, so again, I am Kate. I am from the admissions committee at CBS, and I'm joined today by one of our amazing current students in the MBA program, Ratchet, and I will kick it over to you to give a brief intro before we dive into the tech. Sounds good. Uh, thanks, Kate. Hi, hi, everyone. My name is Rachita Garwal. I am from India originally, and now I'm a second year MBA student at Columbia Business School. Very excited to be doing this presentation with uh, you know, GMAT Club, and hopefully you learn more about CBS through this presentation. So let's get started. Kate, over to you. Thank you. All right, we can skip on to the next slide. Great. So I just wanted to start by briefly highlighting the two main entry points for the MBA program at Columbia Business School. Um, the first point of entry is the traditional two-year MBA program that begins in August. This usually brings in about 550 students each year, and it is the, the traditional MBA with the built-in summer internship. Um, we do also offer a January entry program. Usually we bring in around 200 students for the January start, and it's just more attractive for students who don't necessarily need exposure to a new industry or a new function through that built-in summer internship. So the only difference between these two entry points for the full-time program is that built-in summer internship. Typically, we see students starting in January who are entrepreneurs or maybe sponsored by their company and returning after the program, um, people who are working for their family business, but I do want to drive home the point that this doesn't mean you necessarily can't do an internship. It's just not formally built into the program. Um, about half of our students at Columbia Business School do take advantage of in-semester internships or school year internships, given our location in New York City and the flexibility of the curriculum. Um, so we can jump onto the next slide and talk a little bit more about academics. And then um, following that, we'll talk more about the community at Columbia and finish up with some application tips. So. Um, academics at Columbia are really flexible, and I think something to highlight is our focus on bridging theory and practice, and we do that by having a really nice balance um, between our full-time faculty, tenure track, and our adjuncts. They teach across 14 areas of study, um, and we can go to the next slide, too. This is just to give you an overview of faculty members, um, and I think now would be a great time to have you jump in, Ratchet, and maybe share with the group either one of your favorite professors or favorite classes or academic experiences thus far at CBS. Sounds good. So I, post MBA, I'll be joining a strategy consulting firm. So a focus for me was doing a lot of strategy and leadership classes. So a couple of my uh, favorite classes were actually game theory and operations strategy uh, and like, I really, like I had studied both of them a little bit during my undergrad days, but the way they were taught at CBS was very much, you know, how I believe that I will experience it in, in, in a professional setting, using case studies, using real life examples, using the right level of quant and right level of uh, qualitative inputs. Uh, interestingly, I took both those classes simultaneously and I could really correlate how, you know, one class is more uh, quant focus and one class is more qualitative focus and how they were relating to each other. And I really enjoyed them. And I think easily they are two of my uh, absolute favorite classes at CBS. On the screen, you actually also see introduction to programming using Python. Uh, I took that class as well with the same professor, Matan Griffel, and loved it as well. Like it's, it's taught 
as coding should be taught to like mb student students mm-hmm. like which people from non technical background can also understand and uh, really enjoyed learning python as well thank you so much i was actually going to highlight that class too because we get feedback from students constantly that we just can't offer enough sections of this course um and i think that just speaks volumes to the flexibility of the curriculum wherein students aren't necessarily planning to go necessarily into a career path that will require them to know how to do this but getting that well-rounded business experience beyond the core curriculum um is something that we encourage students to do so we don't require students to declare a major or a concentration um once you do complete that core curriculum in your first sem- semester you can build out the rest of your program entirely with the electives of your choice so if you want to take a really deep dive into one area you can totally do that um but we actually recommend that you step out of your comfort zone and take some electives um to really broaden your horizons um if you go to the next slide we'll see just a very brief sampling of elective offerings at CBS this is again very brief we would never be able to list them all just on one slide we have over i think 340 electives just offered through the business school at columbia um and that number continues to grow each semester we're always adding new courses something else i did want to mention is you can take up to two classes at other columbia university graduate schools as well that would count towards your mba so again a lot of flexibility with the curriculum and though everyone graduates with the same one columbia mba their experience while on campus can be very different and what you make of it um great so moving on to community at columbia which i think is really something that makes us unique um as a business school but the community is very tight knit and collaborative um and there are so many different ways to get involved on campus outside of the classroom so we always say obviously you're coming to business school for the academics and for the classes and to learn from amazing practitioners in the field and faculty members but um getting engaged outside of the classroom is really what makes um the experience so exciting and we offer so many different ways to do that at Columbia so there are over 90 active student clubs on campus right now um and rachit if you want to talk a little bit maybe about what clubs you're involved in and the process for getting into a club and highlighting some of maybe your your favorite events as being part of a club that would be great sure so uh like columbia as you can see has very different kinds of clubs there are professional clubs social clubs and community connections so i'm involved in certain clubs in each of the buckets uh, as i mentioned like uh I am going for to a strategy consulting firm post my MBA so I'm very much involved with the management consulting association uh, I'm also a career management center fellow where I'm as a second year student I am helping the first year students to prepare and that also actually talks a lot about uh, the community that CBS has because there's a strong bond between the first years and second years uh, when I was in my first year a lot of second years really really helped me in my recruiting and now it's like you know uh just giving it back and the process year by year continues other than that i am uh, you know involved with the sports business association uh, uh again it, it, it's a fun activity uh, like i have done uh, i have a professional experience in sports so i'm involved with that i'm a part of homi society uh, through which we are conducting this event today which is again basically uh helping prospective students learn more about cbs uh and, and as a community coming from india i am part of the south asian business association just you know again uh trying to spread more awareness about the south asian culture in in the country in the school uh cbs is a very diverse school we are in new york so uh you know people from more than 40 50 nationalities come here and everyone is really uh keen to learn about different cultures so just you know the events which these community uh clubs organize help we, we all of us know uh, about different cultures i i attended at uh, events of the african club last year of the latin america club last year and those all those are really really enjoying it, enjoyable and just form a strong part of what cbs culture is all about thank you so much um i think we can skip on to the next slide and this is really just to highlight how global and robust our alumni network is at CBS we have more than 47,000 alum worldwide 
um, with New York being one of the largest hubs, and I believe London and San Francisco being um, second and third on the list. But as a student at Columbia Business School, you'll have access to this global alumni network. And then, of course, you'll sustain these connections long after your time on campus. Um, and I, I like to highlight this because we've had so many events recently, especially in these um, uncertain times where we have reached out to alum to speak on panels and connect with our current students. And they are so eager to stay involved. And even when we were fully on campus hosting events, our alumni are always um, excited to come back to campus and attend lunches and speaker series and um, support our students in finding in semester internships and things like that. So the alumni network is huge um, and it's a great, a great draw to the, the Columbia Business School program for sure being part of the network. All right, we can move on over to the application process at Columbia. So when we're reviewing applications, we really like to look at them in three buckets. So the first being academic strength, professional promise, and personal characteristics. Um, I always like to start by saying that it's a very holistic review process. So um, it's definitely more of an art than a science. When we are reading applications, we understand that people have different strengths um, and we embrace that. So when we're looking at academic strength, whoop, no worries, um, lost the presentation, but I, I'm good to keep talking. Okay, perfect. <laughs> um, the academic strength um, begins with your undergraduate record. So we'll ask that you submit um, copies of your undergraduate transcripts from the school that conferred your bachelor's degree and anywhere you have received credit. We don't have a minimum GPA requirement though. Obviously we're looking for people who will be successful given the program is rigorous. Um, again, if you're interested in looking to see maybe where you line up compared to the incoming class of 2020, we do have a class profile listed on our website. Um, same goes for GMAT averages and ranges, but we do require standardized test scores, either GMAT, GRE, or executive assessment. Um, we do not have a preference on which exam you take, so we would encourage you to take the one that you are most comfortable with and feel as though you will perform the best on. Um, if you decide to take the exam more than once, we will consider your highest score. Uh, moving over to professional promise, we'll look for whoop, <laughs> a copy of your professional resume. Um, any resume you would use to apply for a job, usually we try to recommend that you keep it down to one page and focus on highlighting your achievements in your uh, professional roles. But letters of recommendation are um, really important and hold a lot of, of weight within your application. We do ask that one recommendation come from your current supervisor, but we understand that that may not always be possible. So if there is for any reason, um, like a a raise or a promotion on the line and you're not comfortable with asking your current direct supervisor, there is a spot within the application for you to note that. Um, but two professional recommendations are required, no more um, or no less. So if you have supplemental letters of recommendation, you can email them to us and we'd be happy to attach them to your file. But within the application, you can only submit the contact info for two references. Um, and we always recommend that you reach out to them well in advance and, and give them an ex enough time to write a thoughtful um, letter on your behalf. Your post MBA goal here is really just the length of a tweet. It's very brief, one sentence telling us where you see yourself once you complete the program. And then we have three essays. So the first essay is to tell us about your short term and long term post MBA goals. Really, we'd like to see that you can clearly articulate where you see yourself once you complete the MBA program. Um, is it feasible? Does it make sense why you're pursuing an MBA to get there? Of course, we won't hold you to these goals. Part of what makes business school so enriching and exciting is that you can meet with people and get exposure to people that you may not have ever thought that you would end up pursuing a career path. Um, but it is important that you have a good understanding of why you're pursuing business school and your why. Um, the second essay is to tell us about why you want to go to Columbia Business School. So this is a great place for you to show us how you're going to leverage your time on campus. Um, if you are interested in joining any professional or affinity clubs, you can note that here. If there are any particular electives or faculty members that you're excited to take a class with, you can tell us about that in essay two. Um, again, just a great opportunity for us to hear about how you're going to leverage your time on campus at CBS and in New York City. And the third essay this year is a new question, and we've had a lot of fun reading this from an admissions perspective. 
Um, it's to tell us about your favorite book, movie, or song and why it resonates with you. And this is not meant to be any type of trick question. Um, we really just like to get to know our candidates on a little bit more of a personal, authentic level. So this gives you a chance to get creative and tell us something personal about yourself. And really, we just like to see why that resonates with you. Um, and the last piece is an interview. So interviews are by invitation only. If you are invited to interview for the MBA program, we would let you know um, within six weeks of submitting your application. And um, previously they were conducted in person by an alum of the program in the geographic location um, that you are. However, in these times we have moved interviews virtually as you can imagine. So your interview would either be conducted by an alum of the program or a second year current student um, or an admissions officer like myself. And the interview is a great way for us to gauge your fit for the, for the school and then also give you a chance to ask any questions that you might have as well. So that is just a brief overview of what we're looking for from an admissions perspective. Again, just really wanna drive home the point that it is a holistic process. Um, and we, you know, there really are no traditional MBA students anymore. You don't have to have a background in business or a business focused undergraduate degree in order to apply. Um, and if you have any questions ever at all, our contact information will be on the last, last page and we would always encourage you to reach out. Um, if you have questions about the application requirements or process. Great, so this slide is just an overview of our deadlines. I think the most important thing about this slide is that we review applications on a rolling basis. So this is something that differentiates us from many of our peer schools, um, wherein we don't have application rounds. We do operate on a rolling admissions process. So what that means is we are reviewing and rendering decisions as applications are received. Um, the two important deadlines on the slide for the August 2021 entry, if you are interested in applying for the next August class, um, is that our application will be open until April 9th. So if you are interested in starting next August, you do want to be sure you have your application in by April 9th. But due to the nature of rolling admissions, um, Obviously, there are more seats available in the class the earlier that you apply. So um, the other important deadline still here on the slide that I would keep in mind is our merit fellowship deadline, which is January 6th. Um, we would recommend applying ahead of that January 6th deadline if you are interested in being considered for merit-based fellowships and there are no other additional uh, materials that you have to submit for that. You would be um, assessed for merit fellowships based on the merits of your admissions application. Um, and then for future reference, if you are interested in the January entry or future August terms, they will likely be um, around the early October timeframe for the next cycle as well. And we'll post those on our website um, as soon as the cycle wraps up. Great. Well, we were almost under 15 minutes, a little bit over, but I think we would uh, love to spend the rest of the time doing some open Q&A um, and happy to take any questions that are coming in and watch it too. If we have any student experience based questions, he, he'd be happy to, to answer any of those. Thank you both very much. And I think we should also thank um, Albert who is um, answering <laughs> pretty much each and every question there. We have a bunch of them. We also have a bunch of people watching. I even see the exact number 126, which is okay. great. Um, yeah, I also kind of got a little bit dreaming about New York while you were talking. So let's keep this mood and um, let's start with the questions. Let's start with the with some warm up, and there are some questions arriving uh, which uh, sound more like grilling, to be honest. So um, <laughs> I'm excited about the upcoming discussion. First of all, you just talked about the the the, the schedule and the deadlines. There was a question coming regarding um, early decision applicants. How long would a candidate typically wait? to hear back regarding the interview call. And I think this question also applies pretty much to other um, rounds. Sure, so um, for people who ap apply early decision or regular decision, um, we do review in the order that applications are received. So you will get an update once we start the review process of your application via email. At that point, we reserve up to six weeks to let you know whether you've been invited to interview. 
Um, so you'll be you know, well aware of when your review process has begun. And again, it's six weeks, um, up to six weeks until you have found out about an interview. And then just so you know, beyond that point, once you set up the interview, that can usually take about a week or so to match you with an interviewer. Um, and then once the interview is conducted and we receive the feedback, um, we, at, we reserve two weeks from the interview feedback to render a decision. So overall from the beginning um, of review, through to the decision rendering around 10 to 12 weeks usually. All right, great, thank you very much. Let's uh, con let's continue with another part of application and pretty much take a step back, the, the application itself. We, we have a bunch of questions regarding the recommendation. You, you talked a little bit about the the flexibility that you offer, but um, what is your, yeah, what is your general advice? Uh, who is, let's say, second best? Great question. We, we always get a lot of questions about letters of recommendation. So um, again, we require two letters and we ask that one of them does come from your current direct supervisor. Um, if that isn't possible, it can be any professional recommend recommendation who has worked closely with you and can speak to your professional promise and your achievements in that role, in that capacity. So um, it can be a previous supervisor, it can be a colleague. Um, there is some flexibility here, of course, for people who maybe work for a family business. We try to steer away from you know, any family member recommendations, but we have in past made exceptions for case by case basis of clients and things like that. So if it's somebody that you have questions about, you can always reach out to us in admissions and we'd be happy to you know, confirm with you if it's something that we would accept or not. All right. Um, could your supervisor from a volunteering activity, for example, um, be a good recommender? Yeah, I don't see why not. All right, cool. Um, generally about the, the content of recommendation, there are some questions about this as well, because um, yeah, many of um, applicants are actually applying to, to many schools and they, they try to reduce the stress they're causing for recommenders. Um, sure. What is the, the proper strategy here? So first of all, uh, can the recommendation letter be standard? But at the same time, maybe you could elaborate on this. Um, what recommendation letter stands out in your view? Sure. So the first thing I'll, I'll just start by highlighting is that we do have the um, recommender questions already posted on our website and they I don't anticipate that they will change as they are pretty similar across many of our peer school applications. So hopefully that alleviates a little bit of the work on the end of the recommender, given that these questions are very similar across all applications. Um, the way it works for our system is that you'll input their contact information um, that prompts us to reach out to them with an email with very clear instructions for how to submit the letter on your behalf. Um, again, it is just two questions that they can respond to in paragraph form. Um, we really just like to see that they are giving clear, concrete examples of your work um, experience and performance um, and how that kind of will translate to their success in business school and beyond. So um, definitely looking for people who can provide a thoughtful recommendation on your behalf and not just that generic template type letter of recommendation. Um, but again, it is uh, the questions are on our website and they are very similar to our peer school. So hopefully that puts you a little bit at ease um, knowing that they will have to answer similar questions across multiple applications. That's great advice. Thank you very much. Sure. All right, then let's continue to something what I call uh, yeah, application strategy. Um, many people are concerned when, when they see, okay, I'm not something you call average, not of the average age, not average um, work experience, a little bit shorter or a little bit longer. And even more, those uh, people, people who are concerned are rather on the older candidates. What would you recommend to them in terms of the strategy? Some of them cannot decide between MBA and executive MBA. And also how can they stand out and explain why they need an MBA? That's a great question. So. On average, our students for the full-time MBA program have between four and six years of full-time work experience. But if you have a chance to check out the class profile, you'll see that we have um, you know, a, a range of different um, years of experiences and there are no minimum. So there's no minimum requirement. Um, the four to six years is just an average. And ultimately it depends on what you're looking to get out of your MBA experience. If you're looking to pivot into a new industry and you are you know, really in need of that 
internship in order to do that, um, the full-time program might be a great fit. Um, if you are intending to continue working full-time while going back to school, um, the executive MBA might be a better fit for you. And we do have a Friday, Saturday program and a Saturday program. And if you are interested in our executive MBA program, um, I would encourage you to reach out to us and I can connect you with someone from our EMBA team. Um, but again, I wouldn't, um, you know, get too caught up in what the averages are, given there really is no traditional MBA student, like I said. Um, we are a very diverse class profile. I think Racha can probably echo that and speak to that, that there are people in the class coming from a variety of different industries, um, all different age ranges. I don't know if you want to piggyback on on that at all, Ratchet, but that would be my my advice is not to, if you're looking to switch industries or pivot, I wouldn't get too caught up in the experience. We would encourage you to apply. Uh, yeah, I, I just add to what Kate said and like in my class, the pitches class of 2021, uh, I know say a couple of people who are from same undergrad school and they are nine batches apart from undergrad school. So they are like they, the, the age difference is nine years old. Mm -hmm. uh, I have another friend who was from my school and she was in 12th when I was in class five. So again, another seven year age gap. So what Kate said is like, these things are not to be really worried about. Mm -hmm. uh, like Columbia class is very, very diverse. Uh, people from all backgrounds come here. There are musicians, there are investment bankers, there are people from private equity. I have worked in sports industry before. So there's absolutely everyone who can get into Columbia. It's more about investing time in uh, writing those good essays and making sure that we know what your story is, what you want to do, how you want to take uh, the most out of being in New York City. That's all what matters. Uh, age, experience, uh, number of experience, number of years of experience are pretty irrelevant. And I have seen that in front of my eyes for sure. Great. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. I think uh, we have a question which um, resonates to that one. Um, Kate, I, I think I'll start with you, but then I would be also interested in your experience, Rashid. Um, is the program suited for people working in nonprofit uh, social impact? So please, Kate, debunk the myth that Columbia is only a finance school. <laughs> yeah, I think we, we definitely have a reputation for being a very traditional finance school um, where all of our students are coming from either a consulting or an investment banking um, interest. And that is so not the case. And I think this gets more and more diverse each year. Even if you have a chance to check out the class profile, you'll see, of course, we do have a lot of students interested in finance and consulting, but um, the other industries and sectors are growing year over year. And we have a really awesome center on campus called the Saner, uh, Tamer Center for for social enterprise where there are tons of electives and various resources and offerings for people interested in the nonprofit or social social impact space. Um, we have a lot of students who come from public sector type roles and are interested in either um, going back to that space and growing. Um, so it is definitely a myth. We are definitely um, not just a finance school. We have amazing resources for entrepreneurship, um, retail and luxury goods, healthcare and pharmaceutical management, you name it. Um, I think that's really important to mention. Given we are in New York, we are so close to headquarters and practitioners across all industries. Um, and we really do capitalize on that and have faculty members who teach across all of these various spaces. Um, and we have students who intern in all of these various spaces. So Hopefully that debunks the myth a little bit. We did onboard a new dean last summer of the business school, um, Dean Costis Maglaris, and he um, is actually coming from our data analytics department. So prior to that, we had a dean who was from the finance space, and we are noticing and hoping that we will be introducing more and more new courses and offerings um, with him at the helm of the school. So hopefully that, that answers your question a little bit and highly recommend looking into the Tamer Center if you're interested in learning more about what's happening at CBS related to um, social enterprise. Totally. Yeah, I mean, given that how you said, there are so many also international organizations in New York, like United Nations. And if you're interested in this um, career path, that's uh, I think that the location is definitely the right one. So Absolutely. Great. 
Rashid, maybe you could also elaborate on that. Um, did you have any experience with the, the, the activities or clubs related to nonprofit and social impact? Or maybe uh, you could talk about the experience of your classmates? So, yeah, happy to. So I think just starting with what Kate mentioned, it's a, it's a myth that CBS is a pure finance school. Again, like we are in New York City, so we get that advantage of being uh, you know great in finance but that absolutely does not mean that uh, we lag behind in any other fields uh, one thing which i want to really highlight is that uh, which which is you know which people uh, which prospective students do not realize and including me when i was applying two years ago is that uh, it's when you see the recruitment statistics that hey you know it's 30% finance, 20% consulting, and everything else is so less. It's not because uh, students are not interested in going to these schools or like CBS is not providing the avenue. It's just because the demand is less. So to give you an example, at one time, if an, if an investment bank wants to hire 10 people from business school, uh, a social venture will probably want to hire one person. So that is just a problem of demand and it's not a problem of supply from Colombia uh, and that is across all fields but consulting in finance mm -hmm. now coming to the social impact uh, so like I have worked very closely with Tema Center myself I literally just completed a course on investing in social ventures uh, you know where I uh, you know, did a due diligence for a non-profit organization and, and got involved in my own way. I have friends who spend their summer in, uh, in impact investing. Uh, a very close friend of mine spent a summer with Morgan Stanley impact investing uh, practice. So there are definitely ways to get into social impact, non-profit. But again, the thing which I really want to highlight is that if, if you are looking to pivot into non-profit social impact, just because the requirement of MBA students is less in general, it just requires more effort from, from your own, own end. But CBS has all the resources which you need to do. And hence, like, I know two people from my class who were really interested in going into impact investing. Both of them got their internships. If there would have been five people, probably they would have gotten as well. If there would have been 20 people, maybe not. Mm -hmm. That's just how it works. It's a classic supply demand problem. But as I said, CBS has all its resources in place to help students in whatever field they want to go in. Great. Thank you very much. So yeah, I guess indeed uh, some people pivot, some people stay, and some people uh, yeah pivot unexpectedly. And that's uh, the great freedom that the um, MBA program offers. All right, and now let's come to the question which is um, yeah, being asked very, very often, more than ever. Could you talk about uh, the current situation um, about COVID and how it is affecting class sizes, uh, deferrals and your admission policies? That's in the first step, Kate, a question for you, but also I think it would be super interesting for uh, viewers and listeners to hear your experience, Rashid, how yeah how do you like the new situation in terms of what 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 happened or what things you discovered for yourself what you liked in the yeah in the online studies and hybrid studies and maybe you could talk about this later as well sure um yeah you know the elephant in the room is um the situation we've all been faced with in COVID. But I will start by saying that we we did not grant a lot of deferrals this year. We've made a few exceptions for extenuating circumstances on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, and for those who were not ready to start the program, we encourage them to reapply in the next cycle. Um, so again, a very limited number of deferrals at CVS. Um, if you've had a chance to check out our class profile, I know I keep referring to it, but um, we did bring in a class in August, very similar to that around 550 that we typically do bring in in August. So our class sizes are um, not very different due to the circumstances and the deferrals were very limited. Um, so our best advice for the application would be to you know, continue trying to put your best foot forward as it is competitive each and every year. And, and I don't expect that it will be very different this year due to COVID-19. Right. And, yeah, 
Sorry, uh, I'll tee you up, Rachit. So this semester we've actually rolled out um, classes in a high flex format. So we went virtual back in March and through the summer um, and the fall has been high flex. And I'd love to hear you share a little bit more about what your experience has been like, even maybe when we made the quick shift back in the spring up until how things are going now, that'd be great. Yeah. So, you know, when the shift happened in spring about, you know, moving from in-person classes to a complete virtual environment and that was like mid-march uh columbia was surprisingly great like you do not expect you know professors to quickly who, like who are so experienced with 30 years 40 years of experience to quickly switch to new technologies of teaching but it did happen and i was very pleasantly surprised to see how quickly everyone uh you know they modified the content to make sure that it could be taught in a Zoom settings. The case studies were changed accordingly. And I, I really did not feel that I was not getting that, uh, you know, experience of being in a business school because I was studying online. Uh, yes, you miss the in-person experience. Yes, you miss meeting people, but that's, that's the state of the world we are living in. Uh, I feel like CBS has done a pretty good job training everyone, especially the professors. Now, coming to uh, this semester, as Kate mentioned, we moved to a hybrid model. Uh, you know, at one time, 33% of students actually go to the class and it keeps rotating. Uh, so as a second year, I honestly do not have many classes, but I have been speaking to a lot of first years to, uh, to actually see uh, and gauge how their experience has been. And everyone has been really, really happy and, you know, very proud of being CBS students that uh, despite the kind of world we are living in, CBS is able to provide that, uh, you know, experience to them where they are able to meet their classmates, maybe not every day, but like twice a week, uh, where they are able to experience that in-person experience. Uh, we also have facilities for COVID testing, like you can actually take a COVID test once a week, Free of course, you get your results in a couple of days to keep everyone, uh, you know, safe. A uh, lot of events are being moved online. Uh, like, I think this is a common knowledge which all of us across the globe have gained that there are certain things definitely which can happen virtually and we really do not need to meet in person. For example, this event, like if we have this event uh, in an auditorium or we are having this online, I honestly don't think it would have made a difference. It just actually saves a lot of time for all of us, which we would have done on roads. So that learning is there. Like I mentioned about the part of clubs I am in uh, for the sports business association. Every year we wanted to uh, do some kind of panel discussion with sports across, across the globe. And we would fail because we would no, not be able to get people at the right Time. And this time we were actually forced to do it online and we were actually able to have a phenomenal panel with experts from uh, across the globe talking about where sports industry is going, which was so well appreciated. So there is a learning for all of us. And I believe, again, CBS has done a great job adjusting to the new normal. Uh, new York has, as a city, New York is doing pretty okay, uh, fingers crossed. Uh, but it also then comes to everyone's individual responsibility to make sure that everyone is safe. But from a school's point of view, I think uh, whatever best can be done is being done. I, I live very close to the campus. I'm able to, even if I don't have a lot of in-person classes, I'm able to catch up with my uh, classmates one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, another advantage of the location is I feel it's a very pretty location. You have a Riverside Park on one side, you have Morningside Park on one side. You can actually go for walks. Uh, which is safe to do in a COVID world. And I have personally uh, been okay and enjoyed uh, how we are going now. Again, yes, I would want to be live in a world where I don't have to wear a mask as I go out. Mm -hmm. uh, but whatever the best is possible, I think it's happening right now for us. Thank you. And I also just wanted to mention, 
I mean, we totally understand that the, the networking piece and the community piece is a huge reason for pursuing business school. And I'll just say um, how impressed I really was with the resiliency of our students back in the spring and over the summer. They really did step up to the plate and roll out a, a ton of initiatives. For example, the Community is Contagious webinar series where um, students gathered and did fun social things like wine tasting and yoga classes and pasta making classes. So um, the the social fun piece hasn't been lost in virtual times. And of course, as soon as it's safe to get everybody back on campus um, following public health guidelines, we will be eager to do so. But um, there have been a lot of fun things going on to trivia nights and, and virtual happy hours. I know everyone is starting to burn out on with the Zoom fatigue, but um, there are still a lot of opportunities to engage with your peers socially outside of the classroom too. Great, that's, that's really nice to hear. Um, I think that the, the question um, is also how does the current situation affect networking with the, um, the potential employers? So uh, maybe you could draw some example of the events, probably also online events, which help students to, um, yeah, to find internships and to find jobs in the end. Sure. So um, I can s just start by saying that the formal on-campus recruitment process has been moved entirely online virtual for the fall. And that was actually the decision of the, the big companies that we work with and have close partnerships with to go online just to kind of level the playing field and ensure that everybody has equal opportunities to um, go through the process. So that is entirely virtual. And our career management center is amazing and a really robust presence on our campus. They are there for, um, you know, when it comes to recruitment prep and resume prep interview, mock interviews, they have a really awesome alumni coaching program, a second year career management fellows program. Um, so there are a lot of different resources offered through the Career Management Center, um, and they are all still continuing to take place online. Um, Another great resource that we have through the Career Management Center is the Executives and Residence Program, which I believe is still continuing to take place virtually. Um, for those who aren't aware of that, it's a group of 25 or so C-suite level executives who are either retired or semi-retired, and they work really closely with the Career Management Center to set up sort of like coffee chats or one-on-one -on -one mentoring sessions with our students, and they dedicate their time to sharing um, their experiences and insight to, um, you know, across all industries. And usually those connections are pretty sustainable, and it's just somebody that you can work with sort of like a mentor throughout your time at business school. So um, that's another great way to get connected with people in your field. For example, I know um, Lorraine uh, Lockman, she is the real estate um executive in residence at CBS, and she makes it her mission to get you connected with the people in her field in New York. So um, taking advantage of, of resources like that too can definitely help when it comes to landing internships um, and jobs. So that's that's kind of my spiel related to the virtual career management resources, but Rachid, if there's anything else going on or any other um, you know, virtual offerings that they have through the CMC, feel free to, to shout those out. Sure. I think Kate, you covered in terms of all the offerings and you know facilities available. I'll just say in terms of experience, I personally feel it's probably better to do it virtually than in person. I remember doing recruiting last year. I had to run from one event to another. Some day it would rain. Some day it would be super hot. I had to figure out whether I would wear a suit or or just a plain shirt. It's it's pretty convenient to do it when you can just sit in front of your laptop and talk to these companies one after the other. Again, time is super precious. And if you are able to save time just by doing everything virtually, why not? Uh, the brand remains the same. You will still be an Ivy League business school student. Uh, companies are still willing to hire. Uh, yes, it's a tough time, but eventually we will be able to get rid of COVID and companies will need people. So they are willing to hire. It's just the way of recruitment has probably changed a bit. Uh, but I honestly, as I said, do not think it's any way impacting. It probably, as I said, just saves a bit of time of travel. So do not worry about these things. And uh, I also feel that, let's be optimistic, by the time the people who are on this call actually come to campus, 
uh, things are actually much more normal than they currently are but uh, i think it's zero zero impact like uh, all the events are happening uh, all the networking sessions are happening uh, there are so many creative ways now to do all kind of events you can do zoom breakout rooms you can have uh, you know some kind of game activities i know companies have even sent stuff to people at their house to just you know enjoy uh, individually so everything is possible in a virtual environment when it comes to recruiting and networking uh, so absolutely nothing to worry about there this is great that's really very uplifting and thank you very much for for your openness uh, to talk about this because i think this is indeed important and um, um it seems that you really um yeah nailing it and um, thank you very much for to the whole team of uh, cps for for managing the situation so well um, maybe let's also um talk a little bit about about the applicants who in certain ways suffered from the covid situation and namely maybe some of them lost their jobs or there are there are any other things happening in their lives um is it a disadvantage if you are currently having a gap in um, your career or has had a gap um shortly before kate um could you talk about this sure so absolutely um in these times the way we read applications has changed and the world around us has changed so much just in the last couple of months. So um, what I will say here is that we we understand and empathize with people who have had, you know, negative impacts to their professional path to date due to COVID or, or any other extenuating circumstance causing a gap in your career, which is why we have a spot within the application to explain any reason for um, gaps in between jobs. So definitely be sure to include that within the application. Um, and then we also do have an optional essay, which is the fourth essay. Um, this doesn't have to be, you know, well, well written or anything like that. It could even just be a series of bullet points. If there's anything within your application that might be a red flag to the admissions committee or leave us with a question, definitely recommend you fill any, you, you don't leave us anything to question within your application and, and use that optional essay as a place to fill in any gaps and explain um, what might have happened. And, you know, if if in the event that you were unemployed or laid off or furloughed, um, there is a place within the application to note that. And I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't let that deter you from applying to the program, given um, there are so many people who have been impacted by this. Yeah, great. Thank you very much. All right, um, guys, I think we have time for only one more question. Um, and as we already talked about people like uh, rather on, on one side of the range, let's uh, let's talk about the younger uh, part of the range. Um, could you please talk more about the deferral, deferred enrollment program? <clears throat> and especially there is some concern about high GPA in comparison to standardized score. So. Absolutely. I'm, I'm glad this actually came up. So in addition to our full-time MBA program and our executive MBA programs, we do also have a deferred enrollment program at CBS, which is fairly uh, new. We actually just um, accepted, admitted the second class of deferred enrollment students. So um, this is an option for college seniors or people who went directly into a graduate program after undergrad to apply in their last year to business school. Um, it's an abbreviated process, um, the application fee is waived. So if you know that you are planning to pursue an MBA program um, and you want to have that admission in your back pocket, we highly recommend applying through the deferred enrollment program given it is a little bit of an abbreviated process and that fee is waived. So if you apply during your senior year, um, if admitted, you would have to work for two to five years and then you would be able to let us know um, anywhere within that range when you want to matriculate with us. So you would have some time to go out and get that work experience under your belt um, and then let us know when you're planning to start the program. So um, re related to the question about GPA, um, there is a deferred enrollment class profile on our website too, if you'd like to see, see kind of what the averages are, but essentially we're looking for students who have performed really well academically um, during their undergrad as far as standardized test scores, it would be the same recommendation for the full-time program. It's a holistic process. We'd love to see that you've been involved on campus in extracurricular activities for the deferred enrollment program. If you've taken any leadership positions in clubs or student organizations, um, internships look really great as well. If you've interned during undergrad, definitely be sure to highlight that on your resume. Um, 
those are the kind of the points that I would highlight for the review process for the deferred enrollment program. Um, hopefully that answers the question. Yeah, totally. Yeah. And um, if you mentioned many times the uh, class profiles, um, everyone, if you haven't seen those yet, there are links to all the class profiles. And thank you, our moderators, for, for uh, bringing uh, that, that ones up. Um, so we are now concluding our session. Um, this video will be, of course, saved, so you will be able to uh, take a look on it later. Also, all the answers, everything is saved in the thread. All the links are available there. Please also check out GMAC Club. We have a Columbia dedicated uh, thread with uh, where you can chat with people who are applying this year. You can get some support and information from uh, the alumni and from the current student. And um, Kate and Rashid, it was great having you here. Thank you very much. We enjoyed the conversation. And um, I would like to remind everyone that um, in the following weeks, we are continuing with the re regional MBA spotlight and you will be able to again um, see our Columbia Business School presenting in East Asia region, region. So thank you very much, everyone who is watching it. Well, actually, it's a time to sleep, and we heard, uh, yeah, we heard your feedback, and um, we decided to accommodate your needs. And um, there will be even more of the sessions. Just um, follow our schedule on the web page of the GMAT Club. Thank you very much for watching. Goodbye. Thank you all so much. Thank you, guys.